Um, I'm really grateful to you folks for allowing me to come and talk today. Um, I jumped at it when Eric suggested it because these are um, ideas that I'm, I'm beginning. I have to give a, a, some lectures in Europe and uh, I've, I was working on, I, I'm, you are going to have to watch the time because I was working on this literally in the plane and maybe a few minutes ago in my hotel room. So I've been just, and some of it will maybe so old hat to you that it'll be completely boring, but I hope maybe I'll just be able to give a little bit of a new spin on, on it. So um, I'm going to give these two lectures, why we need more coercion, uh, what can we do to make that coercion legitimate, and the bottom line, uh, Klaus Afe heard me talk and he formulated this, this formulation. He said that the dem our demand for legitimate coercion um, is increasing just as the supply of legitimate uh, coercion is decreasing. And so what I'm going to talk about today is why we need more coercion, why the demand is, is increasing, and tomorrow I'll talk about uh, the supply decreasing and what we can do about it. So this is um, the motivation for this presentation. Um, our old friend saying, uh, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And I just want to get an image of Reagan saying this off of Google. And I saw about 100 of these. Um, and I just picked a few to show you. Uh, there's he's saying the same thing over and over again. Um, and this is obviously a very popular slogan because there were, I mean, I didn't count it, but there were, I think, more than 100. I just pulled a few off uh, the web to, uh, to show you. So this is a mantra. Um, and what's missing here is a fundamental logic. The, and I will, when is government a solution to our problem? And I think that one answer is very clear. It's when we need a free access good. And I will go and explain all that. Um, so what I'm going to suggest today is that the challenge for the left is not just to put issues of social justice and so forth on the agenda and to work for those issues, but also um, to see if as many as people as possible understand this very basic logic, which is as basic as the laws of supply and demand, but not very many people uh, who are, I mean, probably a lot of people in this room know this logic, but not every graduating high school person does. Um, and maybe not even everybody graduating as an undergraduate in sociology does. Um, so this is kind of what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to define what I mean by coercion, then I'm going to talk about where the need for coercion comes from, namely from free access goods, and then I'll get to the increasing need for uh, coercion um, in my thing. And then tomorrow I will talk about how the kind of coercion we uh, have to produce uh, should, of course, be legitimate, and how we, how we go about trying to make the coercion that we need more legitimate. So it's just, it's um, by coercion, I mean something fairly simple, which is the threat of uh, sanction or the use of force, and I'll explain that in just a, a minute, which is, um, you know, I, there are at least three basic ways I could get you out of this room, and one is to say, uh, leave this room or I'll shoot you, and that's the threat of sanction, very clearly. Um, the thing you should notice about this is your will is involved, so you could say, Let's say your child would be shot if you left the room. You could say, shoot me. And then I, the person who wants you to leave the room, wouldn't get you out of the room. I'd have a dead body on my hands. So your will is minimally, at least in sometimes, in the threat of sanction, you can accept the sanction. Whereas with force, I, and I just carry you kicking and screaming out of the room. And that, um, that force will include all sorts of things, like the language we speak, the fact that I, before the women's movement, I used his or his instead of his or her. Um, any kind of thing that, that pushes you somewhere against your will without sort of whether or not you're conscious of it, kicking and screaming. And then there's, um, I could also show you correctly that there was a fire in the corner of the room and say, leave the room. And you'd say, holy cow, there is, and rush out. 
Um, and that would not be coercion. So only the threat of sanction or the use of force or coercion. So I'm not going to be talking about um, persuasion. I'm going to be talking about the threat of sanction and the use of force. And we need uh, coercion because of the good old collective action problem, uh, which I'll call the free rider problem. Um, and that uh, comes from a free access goods, the fact that we want some goods that once they're produced, anyone can use without paying them. And those of you who are familiar with the collective action problem will have, know about free access goods perfectly easily. You might have called them public goods. That's what economists call it. But the problem with that phrase is that it includes non-rivalness, it includes this other characteristic. I, we don't want that characteristic in our analysis, so we, have, we don't want to use the word public good, which includes <coughs> it. Sometimes these are called non-excludable goods. But as Duncan Seidel pointed out, sometime my memory of Madden runneth not to the country, um, that technically speaking, a free access good, a good that once you produce it, um, anyone can use it without paying. Technically speaking, sometimes that good is used up, in which case people are excluded. So technically speaking, it's not non-excludable. I think this is a somewhat pedantic point, but um, it, it feeds my desire to use a concept like free access, which normal people can uh, understand maybe a little bit. Um, so that if you produce, um, let's say, defense of the country, everybody can benefit from it uh, without contributing, to, if they, even if those who haven't contributed to it. By the way, if you can't hear me, just um, do this, because I'm hoarse from a cold. So, um, and or defense, defense of the country or law and order, everybody can benefit from it, whether or not they've contributed to producing it, or toll-free roads, um, all these things. And these are the classic 18th century reasons for government, these free access goods. Um, and those free access goods lead to a free rider problem because, of course, if you can get someone else to pay for the road, um, why? and you can use the road without paying for it, um, why would you pay for it? So everybody goes through the logic of letting everybody else pay for it, and that good is underproduced. Um, so I would like you to just do, and I hope maybe some of you will, will do this in your classes, if, if you could pass out little pieces of paper. So everybody um, just get a little piece of paper. I'm going to walk you through this to see if um, uh, you might want to do this in your classes. Um, so I'm going to endow everybody in this room with an imaginary hundred dollars. And then I'm going to um, say that you can write down on this piece of paper and give to me either zero or hundred, nothing in between because I'm trying to keep it simple. So just you're going to be writing down zero or hundred, which you give to me. And then I'm going to be like this giving tree. I'm going to be a wonderful doubling machine. I'm going to double everything I get and hand it back to everybody equally. Um, so um, if I do that, uh, you can see immediately um, that if you, if you give me the $100, you'll get back your equal share of what everybody gave me. But if you give me $0, you'll get your equal share of what everybody's gotten doubled and handed back. But you'll also have your original $100. So you will be $100 richer than all the people who gave, who gave $100. So it's a very simple no tricks logic. It's that the, uh, the, the good, which is the doubled $100, is a free access good. You benefit from it whether or not you've given the $100 or not. So it pays you, it will pay anybody in this room to um, give me zero. Because you'll be $100 richer than the people who will give the hundred dollars. If that's really, really clear. And of course, if you do that, um, then you will um, sort of waste um, this whole doubling machine, which with absolutely no effort on your part, completely doubles your resources. So that's the collective, that's the free rider problem in a nutshell, and it's a great little class exercise. So now would everybody please write um, zero or hundred dollars and pass it up uh, to Patrick, yes, just write zero. Or no, fold it over so it's anonymous. Fold it over so it's anonymous, and just uh, give it to uh, Patrick.
to give that hundred dollars because they'll have this resource that if, if there were no 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 other costs um, to to doing it because they'll they'll be able to use this wonderful resource um, and coercion is one of the ways to do that it's not the only way and I'll go into lots of other ways in a minute but um, if we were to say if you don't if we were to make this non-anonymous first of all immediately social coercion would would snap in and you'd sort of think am I you know, if everybody can see, what am I, am I going to want to be the, the, the person who doesn't give? Because people will now think of me as that kind of person, and, and, in, and I'll, there'll be a reputation created, and that'll create the possibility of threats of sanction, the possibility of possible sanctions later on. Let's say you're the only one who didn't give. Maybe you would be the person they didn't invite to the party um, the next time. So, so coercion is, we say, we make it public, and then we say everybody who didn't give in the hundred dollars gets a fine of one hundred and ten dollars. That makes it worth it while for everybody, and you probably won't have to fine anybody anything. So it's a completely cheap way of, of, of doing it. So just very quickly, you know, this logic was discovered in the fifties. Uh, Rousseau and Hume had had sort of begun to kind of touch on it, but they didn't get the concept of a free access good. Um, and um, Flood and Gresher, back at these game theorists, back uh, after Rand had gotten all this money from the federal government to sort of study game theory and mutually assured destruction and whatnot, these two game theorists began, discovered the, the logic of the prisoner's dilemma. At the same time, a couple of people, a couple of economists, uh, Gordon and Scott, were studying fisheries and they were beginning to stumble on it. So it's one of these things that within about uh, about five or six years, from various different parts of the, the academic world, the, the whole logic of collective action came together, and by 65, Mansur Olson had written it up and focused on this, this thing that causes it all, namely a free access good. So then there was this huge explosion of interest, and so the point at where in 1980, Art Stinchcomb could write an article uh, entitled, Is the Prisoner's Dilemma All of Sociology? Um, uh, and, you know, in your field, sociology, there was mostly interest in non-state uh, prisoners, uh, you know, collective action problems and so forth. But the, that sort of explosion of interest faded away, um, and as a result, I would say most um, graduating seniors in sociology at the University of Mass, uh, in Wisconsin, Madison, don't know this logic. And I think that's too bad. So when do we not need coercion to do this? Well, obviously, you can privatize in some ways. If you had a commons, like an enclosure, yeah, you could enclose it, as they did uh, in all through Europe, particularly in England. Uh, um, or we could use solidarity, duty, other intrinsic motivations. I'm going to go through these quickly, coordination, nudges, humor. Um, so the enclosure movement, although it was unjust, was actually somewhat efficient. That was taking the commons that, uh, where you had the 
the, the collective action problem and dividing it up into private property. When you did that, people began to fertilize more, use the land more wisely, and so forth. Um, public schools, relatively efficient. Public roads, relatively efficient. Robert Nozick, in his uh, wonderful book, um, Anarchy State and Utopia, um, really wants there to be no, go you know, as little government as possible. And he wants to even get rid of law and order and everybody just have their own private security forces. Um, uh, he didn't know the logic of the collective action problem. When that book came out, I was a graduate student and I looked immediately at the index to see, you know, is he mentioning the collective action problem? I had never heard of it. So he wrote this whole book uh, about anarchism without taking into consideration this logic. Um, so, you know, get, having everybody pay for an individual gas mask, that will, people will go out and pay for that. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's a much worse, it's a much less efficient solution than having them take the same money and put in and put a filter on the smokestack so that the air is clean. But nobody's going to voluntarily contribute to the smokestack thing, but, or not nobody, because we'll find out. Have you we got the number? I do. Yes. What percentage contributed? Uh, uh, percentage con contributing $100 was 77%. 77%. It comes very close to the top, which is 78% in a group of political scientists. <laughs> um, okay, so that's, that's the next, top. That's group. essentially the top <laughs> percentage. Um, okay, so this is going to... Um, there's various problems with privatization that I'm not going to go into right now. Uh, but one of them you might notice that private property usually requires a scaffolding of law and order, uh, which is in itself uh, um, a free access good. Um, so the 77%, oh, and how much does everybody take back then? Everybody will get $154.84. 150, so the people who gave zero are walking out with 254, right? So, so if we did this again, you looked around and you said, <laughs> you know, 154 versus 254, which do I like better? It might be that the number the second time would be smaller. Generally, this unravels without coercion, that the number gets smaller and smaller because you wonder kind of like maybe I would like to be among the, the people who walked out with 254 instead of 154. So let, but let's look at, so there were 77% of you actually gave it, no coercion. Why did you do that? <coughs> I would say the chances were very good. There was some combination of solidarity and duty. Solidarity, these are my people. It's sort of us feeling, it's a kind of emotional feeling. Um, and um, we know that uh, now from some work in social psychology, that the faster you make the decision, the more likely you are to uh, go with this emotional response, uh, to, to be altruistic. It looks as if we human beings are altruistic by nature, uh, you know, by innately. Uh, babies, pre-speaking, pre uh, um, try to help other people. Um, and the, the faster you force someone to um, make a decision, altruism, not altruism, the more likely they are to uh, act altruistically. And the longer you give them to think about it, the less likely they are to act altruistically. Um, so there's a kind of emotion of weeness that may have played some role in, in yours, um, in your actions. Um, and then there's duty, Kantian duty, your conscience. What is the right thing to do? Um, uh, what would be, what would the categorical imperative say? That's a cognitive, <coughs> a cognitive thing. That's, those are commitments you've made to yourself. Um, and I'm sure that played some role. Am I, you said to you, um, do I want to be the kind of person who doesn't do this thing that I ought to do? And then there's some other intrinsic motivations that you didn't get that one here. But Wikipedia gets by with people just doing it because it's kind of fun. I mean, some of them may have solidarity feelings, some of them may have duty feelings, but probably a lot of the people who do Wikipedia, it's actually some, sort of fun. Giving $100 is not particularly fun, though. So, you know, there, there's probably not a lot of intrinsic motivation there. Um, coordination, there's ways of getting people to do things um, because you could just change the coordination. For example, driving on the left 
versus driving on the right. In Sweden, they moved from the British system to the US system um, at midnight one night. And they announced to everybody that that was the time they were going to do it. And there were a lot of cops out. But they weren't particularly arresting you. They were just telling you because it was a, because coordination solved the, the, the coercion, if you will, was from the other people who were suddenly starting to drive on the right. If you had continued to drive on the left, you would have gotten the sanction of, so coordination can do quite a bit. And nudges, many of you will have read uh, Thaler and Sunstein's uh, book, Nudges, uh, what, what uh, liberal paternalism, which is that you, so, something that people ought to do, you have something like giving the hundred dollars, you make it easier for them to do. So if you'd walked in the room and I'd said, um, later you will be asked to do this, well, maybe you wouldn't change, have changed your view. But quite a lot of people will save more, for example, put more, will sign up now to put more money in their savings account later, because they don't feel the pinch right now. Um, or you put healthy, healthy foods um, right at eye level, or you, um, uh, you know, you, um, you, you, you make giving your, your or if you, if you are in an accident, giving your organs to, as an organ donor, you make that the default. So, in, or, or 401k, any default option is a matter of choice architecture. So you pick what would be good for either you personally, that would be the paternalism, or good for the, for the society as a whole, then it wouldn't be paternalism but you might want to substitute a nudge for coercion. The one that I like um, most is the, um, the fly and the men's urinal in the, in the Dutch airport. They just painted that at the, on the back of the urinal um, as a sort of thing to aim at and ha have their cleaning bills. Um, so, so, so why have a cop out there telling you to aim properly when you could just have a fly that, you know, so we, would, we want to use these when we can. Um, and humor, um, uh, Mokush, the, um, the wonderful mayor of uh, Bogota, uh, got, really was able to cut down on corruption tremendously by changing the culture. And one of the ways he changed the culture was through humor. It's one of the things he did, gridlock, is a, is a very clear collective action problem, free rider problem, because the, um, you benefit from that, from the, the crossroads being free and good, even if you don't contribute to it. Um, so he got a whole bunch of mimes dressed up in those black suits with the black top hats and the white faces. And whenever they saw anybody going into the cross, uh, going in, uh, into whatever it's called. Intersection. Intersection, thank you. In, into the intersection, they would jump in front of the car and make dramatic, you know, no, no, no moves, and everybody cracked up. But what it did was it reinforced this, this notion of duty and solidarity through humor, and he did many, many things like that. I'm sure we're running over. Well, <laughs> yeah. so, so the point is you don't absolutely need coercion. You can use all these other things, um, but you can't always get the job done with those other nice things, and so uh, you need coercion. And um, if you're in a small group, the sociology department, whatever, and it's not, it's not anonymous, you can get a huge amount done just through social coercion. Um, and, but uh, once you get to um, a, uh, a large anonymous society, where your reputation doesn't follow you. So social coercion works through reputation. You do exit time one, and it follows your reputation follows you to time two. So I can sanction you at time two for what you did at time one. If I have no idea, if it's a large anonymous society, I have no idea what, what you've been doing at time one. I'm meeting you for the very first time. This is not going to, and I'm not going to see you ever again. This is not going to work very well. So that's the point that in large anonymous societies, you're going to need a lot of state coercion. That's why I put it in red and made the letters bigger. <laughs> so, so that's the big point. I'm going on a little bit, but I'm going to go on to talk about why it's increasing. But I want to just find out, since this is sort of the big first point, questions? 
Let's go back to when you asked us zero versus 100. Yeah. Um, is there the assumption that we all have the same amount in the bank? No, so it's co more costly to some people than others. In this case, it was equally costly because these were imaginary dollars. So equally non-costly. In other words, I endowed you all with an equal endowment to begin with. It was actually imaginary dollars. So even if you were a poor person, if I'd given you a real hundred dollars, there would have been differential needs for that hundred dollars. The graduate students would have needed a lot more than the professors. So the cost of their giving it would have been higher. But in this particular case, because it was imaginary dollars, the, the, the cost was absolutely equal to everybody. Because I'm thinking of tax resi resistance to higher taxes. And mm -hmm. I might say I'm happy to pay someone higher taxes. And the person down the street might not be able to. So yeah. I think that yeah, resistance to higher taxes out. often comes from need. But often resistance to taxes comes from simply not getting the, the logic of the free rider problem. There are large numbers of people in the world who don't know this logic. It's like in, in some less developed countries, there are large numbers of people who don't know the logic of supply and demand. They know it a little bit. They know perfectly well that if they have a bad wheat crop uh, one year and, and all their neighbors have bad wheat crops, the price of wheat's gonna go up. They don't fully get this is all the pieces of the logic of supply and demand. This is this logic is one step more complicated than the logic of supply and demand. And it's not an accident that humanity didn't discover it until 1950. It's just a little bit more complicated. But if people did understand that logic, they might, you know, that's there I mean I saw some I saw a, a guy in Vermont reported in the New York Times saying, well, why don't we just voluntarily contribute our tax? He didn't get that it's a free access good. The things that the state was doing with it was free access goods. It's not going to work without coercion. <clears throat> and resistance is going to go up when you, as you said, we noticed somebody, a few people got 254. Yes, they put it the zero. ones who get zero. And if you did it again, it would there's unravel. going to be some resistance. More people right would give zero. It. And then the next time around, more people would give zero. And then after you start going a little bit in that way, it would go down very, very quickly. So you need coercion. Even if you're using solidarity, duty, et cetera, having fun, all these other things that are not coercion, you often need a little coercion just around the edges to keep that going. And so that I'm going to get to that in, in just a second, I hope, but unless I edit it out. No, I didn't. Okay, so, so when you're designing this coercion, obviously you want to make it minimal. You don't want to have, uh, we want only enough coercion to get that remaining. We might decide the cost of the coercion is too great. 77% is just fine. We're, we're not going to go after the other people. It would be more efficient to have everybody else give, and then that we wouldn't waste that um, almost a quarter of the doubling tree. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll live with that because um, we, for many reasons, one through a hundred, we don't want to use coercion. Um, so we'd like to use this as much as we can. Um, and the, but the problem is we have to design this coercion fairly well because we know since, you know, way back when, I think it was the 60s that Daisy and Daisy uh, did their original um, extrinsic motivation drives out intrinsic motivation experiments. And the way those go are, I love the first one they did. They had all these students, naturally as a university, naturally with students, they had these students come in for, to, for, their, for an experiment. Um, the students had to do it for class. And they made them wait in the waiting room for about half an hour before the experiment began made them. And though they were, they were, all their backpacks and stuff were taken away, so they had nothing to read, nothing to write, and they left a lot of jigsaw puzzles around. And after a couple of minutes, realizing that, you know, whatever, it's, the students started doing the jigsaw puzzles. And, you know, kind of got into it and started doing the jigsaw puzzles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, then they did the experiment. The thing was, half of them were then taken into a room and paid to do jigsaw puzzles. Another half were paid to do something else. Then they brought them back and said, you know, get the paperwork, 
pretty soon, oh, there's been a problem with the computer. I'm afraid you're going to have to wait here another 20 minutes. So the, they waited in the room with the jigsaw puzzles. The people who had been paid to do it were much less likely to go back and do the jigsaw puzzles now that um, they're just sitting there in the ante room. Because the, they were now thinking of jigsaw puzzles as something that you get paid for. I'm not getting paid for it now, so I'm not going to do them. People who had not been paid grooved on the jigsaw puzzles just the way they had before the experiment. So this is a matter of extrinsic motivation driving out intrinsic. And another more recent example is um, it's done in Israel. Um, some of you may know it. Um, they, a daycare center um, started fining parents for picking up their kids late. Because some of the parents were picking up their kids late. So they started fining them. Putting in the fines increased the number of parents picking up the kids late. Because now it became an extrinsic matter. It was no longer about being a good guy or a good mom picking up your kid on time. Now it was more like just a fine. You know, whatever. I can pay, I'll pay it. It goes. So, so, and there are many, 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 many thousands of cases in which extrinsic motivation and coercion is an extrinsic motivator drives out the intrinsic. So you have to figure out how do you use solidarity, duty, having fun, whatever, all this stuff, um, and put enough coercion in there to keep the thing from unraveling, or maybe even to make every single person in this room give the hundred dollars, which would be the most efficient of all. So you can do this, it's never been kind of applied to government, but you can do this in, uh, let's say, recycling. If you pay people to recycle, they'll recycle less. But if you give them, instead of paying them, if you give them the same amount of money from the local merchant saying, because you are such a wonderful person recycling, here's some, we think so well of you, we're going to give you these, these, um, these coupons, which are essentially pay. You can use them in our local stores. So if you, if you design it as an honor, take, for example, take the salary that everybody who's a professor in this room is making. Um, if, you, if you were being paid for each word that you wrote, you'd have a different attitude to it. But if, now actually Wisconsin used to have an egalitarian salary structure, but, um, but it still isn't egalitarian from, I, from, from associate to full, I would imagine. So when you get a raise to full, you like the money, but it's been, it's been couched as an honor, as a recognition for all the things you did in, for these other reasons. And when you do it that way, it does not drive out the intrinsic incentives. So you want to design rewards as honor, and you want to design punishments to be reasonable. And you also want this coercion to be legitimate, but I'm going to talk about that next time. So now I want to talk um, about why is our need for state coercion increasing. Um, we, and now I hope I've, I hope I've made a totally ironclad case for state coercion in large anonymous societies. Now, why is it, why is our need for state coercion increasing? For two reasons: our increasing in interdependence, and um, what I will call using up nature. So. Um, just looking at increasing interdependence first, um, uh, Josh, Josh Cohen, Joshua Cohen, not the philosopher, but the psychologist, in his recent book, just came out uh, this year, writes, the story of life on Earth is the story of increasingly, increasingly complex social cooperation. Just think about it for a second, you will see that this is true with a capital T, and it's also true that this may be even exponential that um, you know, social cooperation started slowly under the hunter-gatherers, and it may, our need for so social cooperation, complex, the complexity of it, may be increasing sort of as we speak right here in this room. So I want to give two examples, a trivial one and a, and a world-shattering one. The trivial one is, uh, these days I can get blueberries in the winter. When I was a kid, you got blueberries in blueberry season. It was fun. Wow, blueberries, blueberry season. Now you just walk into Stop and Shop or wherever, buy blueberries. That's great. So I have blueberries. It's not the reason I put this under trivial is if the world took my blueberries away, this would be a small decrement. But 
I want them enough to pay for them in the supermarket. It's something that enhances my life. Very nice. Okay, to get those blueberries. Chile, about 90% of the blueberries in the United States come from, uh, in the winter come from Chile. Chile has some of the strongest food growing plants, food safety standards in the world. That's a free access good, and it's paid for by the coercion of the Chilean government, getting taxes from Chileans, and, um, and producing this free access good. Those blueberry farmers also have access to information that the government provides about the markets in the rest of the world, particularly North America. What are blueberries selling for now, you know, what were they selling for last year? What, what maybe, should, how many do you think you should plant? The um, information on irrigation, help in ir irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Large numbers of free access goods being produced by the Chilean government. Then, you know, roads to the port, put them on the, the emissions from the, you know, having safety stuff for the emissions for either the planes or the, or the boats. Board on the other side, roads, et cetera, law and order, just to get those lousy little blueberries on my table, is this thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of free access goods. And the more places that we're getting it, the more complex this is, the more free access goods are going to be needed. And I, I don't think I need to say anything about global warming. You all know that this is the free access good par excellence. Um, it's everybody benefits from st a stable climate, um, but nobody has to pay for it, and then, therefore it's not getting produced. If we could, now you know, if you looked at Al Gore's *In the Inconvenient Truth*, I should have had a picture of this. Um, look at the movie. You come to the end. You know, it's staggering. Um, all the glaciers melting, everything. I mean, he's he makes his point all right. And then at the end, so what can we do? You know, well, we can recycle. Um, it's all individualist. There's hardly anything that says anything about coercion. And yet, if you're really worried about that problem, we need state coercion. We need carbon taxes, we need other sorts of things in which the state is producing penalties for people who, that, but we, we stay away from that. So, um, so that's connected with my next point, which is, that we, we're using up nature, so to speak. There's lots of free access goods that quote unquote nature used to provide. It used to be that there was tons of free air, of uh, clean air just around. All you had to do was breathe it. You didn't have to pay for it. Well now, you know, the East Coast gets the winds of the West Coast, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can have a million wonderful laws in Massachusetts, but you're gonna be suffering from whatever happens west of you. Um, clean water, again, uh, we had, it's not that clean water is a new problem. We've got uh, water rights laws going back to the Middle Ages uh, about, uh, about not, you know, not fouling the water. But by and large, we took clean water for granted. We take just having access to any water to drink for granted until very recently. Fish, you know, there used to be tons of them. Um, uh, forests, etc. So there's all these things that were free access goods that we didn't have to worry about using up, um, and now we do. So now we have to pay for it, and that means we have to have coercion. Anything that we can't get through solidarity duty, we get a lot through solidarity. I bet everybody in this room recycles, so that's solidarity and duty for you. But that's not going to get us to a stable climate, and for that we're going to need a coercion. And it's not going to get us clean air, clean water, lots of water, fish, and forests either. Just solidarity and duty. So, um, what did I, I've done that, right? Yeah, so law and order, defense, food safety. And even, you know, things that, all the things about the free market. Having a stock market that people sort of trust enough to, to pay attention to the, to sort of give any credence to the numbers, takes a huge amount of, of regulation and monitoring and coercion. Having patents, same thing. All of these things, you know, you don't, almost don't have to be told this, but it would be useful if our students knew this. Um, so, so these free access goods are increasingly needed as we use up nature, and this is the question that 
everybody should just be asking all the time, just as we sit here. Um, uh, well, you know, I'm not sure whether my lecture is a good or not. <laughs> if it were good, it's a free access good. Pretty well, you know, how, how does it get paid for? Well, very, very subtly through the Haven Center gets its money. But the money that 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 I, you know, that that paid for my airplane fare is not going to some some scholarship students uh, scholarship. This free access goods all over all over the place, and you then you start to say, if I need a free access good, I probably need state coercion to create it. So. This is a logic is important to the supply and demand, and I, um, and that's kind of, it's a very very simple point, but I'm more or less trying to be a propagandist for the point, um, and uh, that's about the demand for state coercion is increasing, um, and next time I'll talk about how the supply of legitimate state coercion is decreasing. So this puts us in a in a bit of a bind. Thank you very much. I just had a, an observation. I think in your list you gave two reasons, primary reasons for the cause of the need, increasing need, as increasing complexity, interdependence, and the problem of the uh, uh, exhaustion of nature. Um, I think there are other things that you added to the list, so which explain why there may be a decline in the normative foundations that might make less coercion needed. Uh, so one is um, increasing inequality. Increasing equality. Inequality. Yeah, inequality. Okay. Yeah, inequality. Which reduces yeah. the solidaristic aspect of which high solidarity means less need for coercion. Right. And um, increasing competitiveness, which isn't the same as increasing inequality, although inequality may be partially a consequence undermines the sense of duty because uh, it's winner take all, we can all it for ourselves, greed is good, dog eat dog. I mean, to the extent that that is embodied in intensification of competition, that erodes the duty side. Right. So I think both of those, particularly for things like um, tax, willingness to pay taxes, right. where, at what point does the resistance kick in? If you feel a lot of solidarity or a lot of duty, Right. The, the level of taxes at which you say this is too much would be. Right. Yeah. I agree with both of those points. That, 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 those are terrific points. And if we go to taxes, it makes, it, it also shows the way that coercion around the edges, I sometimes call this a moral core of duty um, and solidarity, um, and, then coer and then a periphery of coercion. And the goal is to make that moral core as big as possible and the periphery as small as possible. But if you take away that periphery, you give the unraveling and taxes are a perfectly good example. When the IRS stopped, uh, not stopped, but cut back under, under pressure from Republicans and others, cut back on um, auditing taxes, uh, then that sort of, that removal of the coercion from the edges meant that more people started cheating on their tax returns. And that meant that the norms themselves began, began to change and it undermined the solidarity and the duty. You began to feel like a sucker. If you, you know, somebody said, you know, you, you, you're not taking that lunch. And, you know, you don't you want, want to take the receipt from the lunch we just had together uh, to put down on your, on your taxes as a deduction. Well, you begin to feel like some little goody two-shoes um, some kind of weird outlier um, if everybody's expecting you to take, and, then, and of course that's just a, a, a tiny example from my own life. You get into corporate finance, um, and I knew somebody at Wells Fargo, um, and she, she had to, she sort of had to fight the people in her bank to get them to do the right thing, because they thought they were being suckers to do the right thing. They were just going to be taken advantage of you point to competition, ranking duty go down. That would be a perfect example of the competition of the other banks. We can't do the right thing. We have to lie and cheat on, on what we report to the government because otherwise we're going to go down the tubes under, under competition. So we have to throw duty out the window. Um, and if the regulations had been placed sufficiently, 
is that is that circle of coercion, that periphery of coercion that held firm, I'm not saying there would have been none of this, but you wouldn't have seen that unraveling to the bottom, as much of it. How I define you which, define which free access goods require coercion. Which free access I, goods? Because I kept wondering about the absence of any normative or moral framing of what are the goods around which we agree we need to have coercion and how we get there in a particularly right. in a diverse and unequal. Right. Lacking the, we're not all Catholic, although perhaps we should all convert. Right. So I, I deliberately kept on the, you know, I put justice down on one of the slides, but I didn't mention it with my words. Um, I, I deliberately kept on the deficiency uh, uh, um, plane. Um, but, you know, you can think of justice itself as a free access good. When Rawls was writing a theory of justice, um, if you're, anybody ever reads that, uh, the, in the beginning pages, he says that his aim is, and this is a direct quote, a society of willing cooperation. That, that a society of willing, well, a society of willing cooperation is obviously more efficient, but it's also good. And he wanted to live in a society of willing cooperation. And he was saying one problem, one reason we don't get a society of willing cooperation is we've all got competing conceptions of justice, so it's very hard to kind of hold justice up is what everybody ought to do to get those motives of duty going for justice. If you've got 700 different competing notions of justice, it's going to be hard to gin that up. So here our Rawls will try to give his fantasy was, you know, here I can kind of get people to agree on a kind of minimal understanding of justice. And if we all kind of get behind that and people, then, then you can make a better argument for acting justly. And a just society is a free access good in the sense that even if you don't contribute to it, you benefit from it. You, be you may benefit from it morally because, you know, like I feel better when I'm in Wisconsin. <laughs> Not that you guys are very moral, but you know, <laughs> you're a little, a little more moral than maybe the average. And, it, and, it, and it, sort of, it reeks like this room is a good room. I'm happy to be here. The Haven Center is a good place. I, I love it because it responds to my moral sense. But I haven't contributed, at least until this moment, and I'm not sure this is a contribution, but in any case, but I've never contributed to making this happen. But I've benefited from it. So the Haven Center is a, a free access good for the campus. I mean, it's not, the campus pays for it, but, but, the, but many, many people who, who are touched by the Haven Center don't pay for it in any way. It's a, it's a free access good. It makes the campus a better place in a moral sense. So you could say many of these things from a moral perspective. I was avoiding that because I was trying to aim at the, the Reagan poster. You know, I was trying to sort of produce an argument that somebody who rejected any of that would nevertheless have to agree to. But yes, I think a moral world is an important thing in itself, and it is, in many cases, a free access good. Thanks, I love the talk. Um, I'm curious about a problem that seems to emerge insofar as state power is still, even in the most powerful state, constrained within the territorial boundaries of whatever sovereign state you're dealing with. But most of these problems that you list in an age of exploding complexity are totally exceed the, the territorial boundaries of the existing yes. state. Yeah. And there's really no kind of framework for dealing with problems like clean air and water, which right. are not easily contained within those boundaries. And the same goes for the global capital, with yeah. labor migration, all sorts of these things. So maybe there's a question for tomorrow. But you know, okay. how do you reconcile the the kind of expanding spatial complexity of the, these free rider problems with the, the, the size of state, the yeah, yeah. physical, territorial yeah, kind of state yeah. power that we're left with. Well, it's the race of our lives. I mean, um, 
those of you who are younger than me, it's the most important thing ever. Ever, ever, ever. Just plain old ever. Um, not, I don't, that's not an exaggeration. It's just the truth. And so it's, I'm not quite correct that, it, that we have no framework. We have a panoply of international organizations and so forth and treaties. Um, so we have treaties. Um, and uh, William Nordhaus gave his um, presidential address to the American Economic Society last year uh, in which he uh, laying out a framework of, of, of that he he did not dub clubs, but it, but he took took the word and sort of popularized it with the idea of a club that those who the coalition of the willing, so to speak, those who would agree to sign a treaty, would not only sign a treaty to have very high carbon taxes, etc., but also at the same time would put up their tariffs on everybody who didn't join the club by an amount that would tax them the amount that they would have had to pay to join the, to join the club in the way of, of making their taxes on carbon higher. Um, so if you could get people to be willing to do those two things, not just to, to promise to do it themselves, but also to put the tariff on, you could maybe create something that, without going to kind of world government, which we're, we're not going to get, you know, um, but supposing the club thing doesn't work. We've got a treaty arrangement. Um, a lot of people don't like these treaties with other countries. Um, where's our sovereignty? It's disappearing, bad, 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 you know. And I'm a big decentralist, Eric will tell you. I'm participatory democracy from way back, you know. I decentralize it to the block, to the, you know, I, I'm very, in favor of decentralization. This is not something that's super easy to do that way. And one of the problems is to get people even to agree to those, to those treaties, they don't get this logic. And Al Gore probably didn't get it either. If he did, he was chicken uh, when he put the stuff that we should do because he, he, he didn't bite that bullet. And that is the bullet that has to be bit. So even in the framework, we have a framework. We, we do have, we don't, we don't have a, a, a comprehensive framework, but we have a few, a little scaffolding, and we can build on that scaffolding if we can get people to understand the character of free access good. Thank you, it's very, very interesting. I mean, thinking of it, um, I'm, I'm worried a little bit that the framing of things like justice and nature and the Hayden Center as goods sort of evokes this the material aspect of it as opposed to their relationships and sort of right relations and and it puts it a little bit more in that frame mm -hmm. um, I know this is a big issue with the idea of ecosystem services which which I think is exactly the critique of our relationship with nature we need to start paying for these things um, but I think that pushes you into a frame where you end up actually requiring more coercion and it sort of undermines the solidarity motives. And I'm that, not sure how we reconcile this. Yeah, that's an absolutely terrific point. And that's what I was getting to when I talked about design. Yeah. That not only should the coercion be mineral, minimal, but it should be designed, if possible, to try to retain, not just retain, but to underscore and to support those intrinsic motivations the way it would if we could design the coercion here. Uh, it would. It would keep the people who are doing things for the non the non material reasons, for for relationship reasons, for for justice reasons, for duty reasons, for 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 good for for reasons that have nothing to do with coercion. And by the way, and this is also true of bads. I mean, I, we're talking about goods. Uh, you also need to. I mean, if you want to kill lots of innocent people, you probably you know you have to go through the same logic. Um, if people will benefit from the killing of lots of innocent people and you want to do it, you have to, but I'm, I'm going to stick with the goods for the moment. Um, that that you, you, you want to design it in such a way as to try not to drive that out. But, but it's a mistake, I think, to think that those things will just continue to work if there is no periphery of coercion. And, and that's the, that, that is, I, I think, a mistake that some, some people make. They don't see the supportive role that a periphery of coercion can, can have 
for allowing it. Um, so it's what I what I, I said in, called in one paper I wrote a while ago. I called I called the ecological niche for altruism. It, it, it provides a way that altruism can survive um, because for competitive reasons you might be very well undercut if uh, if some people could could do the bad thing while you're doing the good thing. I mean, um, you know, even Mother Teresa, somebody feeds her. You know, that doesn't take, that doesn't take emotion. <coughs> but because of that, she, um, you know, she, she couldn't just not have a job and survive. You have, to, you have to think through the survival of things like solidarity and duty. What will make them survive? And how do you design, how do you design your coercion as, as much as possible to, to make that work, and that, that's part of what I'll talk about uh, tomorrow. But maybe since I've got extra time, I'll just venture into that sure. that territory a little bit. Because um, one, one one way might be um, you could make a little bit more effort to explain what the rationale for any particular piece of coercion was. So tomorrow I'll be talking about coercion at the point of implementation, as well as uh, sorry legitimacy at the point of implement, implementing the coercion, like the COP, as well as legitimacy at the lawmaking level. And, you know, so you're stopped on the freeway for going over the 65 mile an hour limit. And when you're given the ticket, you're also given a tiny little pamphlet explaining why the legislature picked 65. That, you know, 75 kills lots of people, 55 kills fewer people, but nobody's gonna do 55. So we went for 65 because it only kills X number of people and not the 75 which kills X plus. Just a teeny little pamphlet, half, you know, three quarters of the people are not going to read it, but, well, you know, somebody might just take it home. The gesture of explaining it, you know, of saying we're in this together, this is, this is us giving laws to ourselves, um, that mindset of, of a of, of we're, you know, this very Rousseauian, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, we're giving laws to ourselves. And there's, there's ways that you can, you can design the coercion. So this is why we're doing it. You know, and that's more likely, I think, to support the solidarity. If it's just sort of big brother comes in with the coercion machete, you know, and slices big paths, swaths through your life, <coughs> then that's not you, that's them. And you, it, it, it sort of encourages you to say, well, okay, it's not mine, it's, 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 not, it's not up to me. To heck with it, they've walked in, you know, they're taking over, let them deal with it. I mean, you don't necessarily go through that whole, th you don't necessarily go through that whole thought process, but shifts the locus of responsibility to lazy all the others, um, yeah. Thank you very much. This was enormously stimulating. Um, I wonder, though, if, if there doesn't need to be a more explicit uh, recognition of the historical nature or the, the, the way in which uh, public access goods, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, free access goods come about. Because it seems to me it might make a, a very real difference. Now, you did mention very briefly the enclosure acts, which were certainly not a fun time. If one the witches? The Enclosure Acts. And the Enclosure Act, yes. Uh, you did mention those, and it certainly, those certainly weren't fun if one happened to be they one of them. They certainly weren't. They were deeply unjust, right? Getting booted off the land. But um, if I'm a, a peasant or a worker and I am forcibly conscripted to build a road, do I consider that a, uh, a free access good? Well, the road would be the free access good. Well, not for me, because the I, conscription wouldn't be. The conscription is the blood. coercion. Mm -hmm. the co so, so it all, you know, uh, the, 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 the coercion we design, if, if we define the word legitimate to refer to the process by which the law is made, we want the law to be the result of a legitimate process. We also want the, the law to be just and to have just outcomes if possible. I mean, these are these are things that that make a law a, a good law. But it has a good, good outcome. The, in the, your case, the free access good is the road. And if you're being just forced to pay, you know, to pay for it and all, 
Lord of the Manor does is sit back and enjoy it, that's deeply unjust. You're giving far more to the creation of that road than you ever get out of it. And he gets a whole lot more because he's going back and forth to London. You've never stepped out of your village. He's, you know, he's, and he's got the this and that coming. Um, so you're not getting very much out of it and you're paying a huge ton. So that's a, a, an unjust levy. It is unjust, but it's not, it's not free access for me. The road is free access. Well, I mean, presumably, presuming there's not a toll. Just paid for it. How can it be free access? No, no. well, it's, once it's built, Unless it's a toll road, if that peasant wants to get from his mother's house to his aunt's house, he can now go on a road which is much less bumpy. I mean, in fact, there he can go on a road at all. Instead of going a little path through the woods, he can take a cart. Um, and then that means, unless it's a toll road, that means it's a free access good. The, 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 the meaning of free access good doesn't have to do with how it comes about. It has to do with the fact that anybody can use it without paying it. I know, and I want to push you about your origin, how it comes about, I guess. That's what I find. Well, That's free access goods can come about in, in any, any million different ways. I mean, nature can provide them, yeah. for example. Clean air. Um, that, that came about not through anybody trying to make it. Now that we can't get it very well, we have to make it. Um, and how do we make it? We can make it justly, justly or unjustly. We can make it through solidarity and duty only, or we can make it through, or uh, we can make it through a little bit of coercion too. And then the question for next time is, if we're going to have this coercion, how do we make it as legitimate as possible? And I'm not talking even about justice because I'm going to leave that to to Rawls, but um, or other people. But I'm talking about how I'm going to talk next time about how can we make the uh, the creation of that coercion and the impo and the imposition of the co both, both the lawmaking level and the imposing level, how can we make those as legitimate as possible? But the, the road itself is a, is a free access good if everybody can use it without paying. That's that's the definition of the good. Um, I think this is an interesting discussion, and I I was really struck by in your definition of a free access good. Um, this idea, for example, a road, right? A road is a free access good, but over time it deteriorates, right? So the, the sort of access... Wait a minute, wait, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a second. You're talking about the road deteriorating in the sense that the the asphalt deteriorates? Over, over time. Yeah, because that's not what... I didn't, talk, I didn't talk about that, but let's add that into the mix. So over time we need to repair the road. Once we've repaired it, it's a free access good. Yeah, and um, the interesting thing with the climate example is there's such a temporal dimension to this. And so I think many people, just everyday people that I, that I interact with, um, they think of a stable climate as, or they think of climate instability as something that affects future generations. Right. And obviously, we're already seeing the impacts. But I'm curious about if you have any comments about the sort of particular temporal dimension of the climate crisis and the way in which that might affect how people think about what kind of coercion is legitimate yeah. and what kind of coercion is not. Um, I don't, yeah, um, that's an interesting how, how it would affect what, how, what people thought it was le legitimate. The, the time dimension, I think, is a is a orthogonal to this, you know. We know that even when it's us, just within our own psyches, um, we value something more, you know, that I'll value getting $100 tomorrow more than I will or promise for $100, or even the certainty of $100. Um, you know, I'm 75 years old, I, I might not be alive two months from now. Um, so, but even you, you know, nice young person, you know, you still might not value the $100 that you're going to get 10 years from now as much. So that's, you know, we know about that. That's time discounting. We've known about that for a million years. And then you talk about future generations. Oh my gosh, that's not even just within me. That's people I've never met, never will meet. So obviously that makes it m much, that 
brings us much more into the realm of solidarity and duty, and particularly duty, because or you know or it requires a certain kind of solidarity to have an emotional sense of we-ness with people who you know it's sort of hard to imagine them because they're so far in the future. So, but but lots and lots of people do feel that sense of we-ness do set do feel sense of duty, but it's attenuated. Um, it's, it's more attenuated than if you saw somebody drowning, you know, right there, out, you know, 10 yards from you, five yards from you, who had a face and was screaming, um, and they needed your help. Both your solidarity and your duty would be through the roof on that one, because it's so proximate. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big issue, but I don't think it, uh, it's orthogonal, I think, it's separate from the this other logic that I'm talking about it makes it harder, um, but um, because uh, you know, because we're not going to be experiencing so much, or at least I'm not. You are more going to be experiencing it. But the, yeah, and and there is always a little temporal dimension because the cost is now and the payoff is is tomorrow. I'm a little deaf, so if you could okay. yell, that would be great. I, I was interested in how you listed interdependence as one of the reasons why we need more state coercion. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought of uh, Carol Pakeman talking about feminists endorsing the welfare state because it was a means of it was a means of recognizing people's interdependence. Um, but of course, that what is a means of recognizing people's interdependence? The welfare state. The welfare state. Recognized. Yes. But then yeah. that recognition of interdependence, of course, wasn't forthcoming. Um, and I attended a talk by Jane Collins a couple of weeks ago, where she was talking about the Wisconsin uprising and about how much of the resistance to uh, the state in Wisconsin uh, is related to um, myths, myths of independence, basically, and and also the sort of stigmatization of dependence and how dependence is both gendered and racialized. Um, and so I was wondering how you, whether or not, I mean, this might be something you're going to talk about tomorrow, but no, I just wanted to, it's good to yeah, address yeah. the topic of interdependence and think about, and, and just ask you whether you've been thinking about the relationship between the free rider problem uh, and dependence. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a really great point because um, no, I'm not going to talk about it tomorrow. So it's, I'm glad you raised it. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to get across is how dependent we all are on huge numbers of free access goods that we don't recognize are there. So all the people who are talking about being independent, sure, let's just you know take anything they do. And you can immediately sort of deconstruct it and see all the free access goods that they're depending on, all the ways that the state is supporting the market or whatever it might be that they're thinking they're doing independently. And they're not doing it independently at all. It's very, very, very interdependent um, and very dependent. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, an Im that's a strong implication of, of what I'm saying about interdependence and what I'm saying about free access goods, that they're, that they're everywhere and that we, we take them for granted. Okay. So, yeah. I'm kind of, so what I'm hearing is that what you're trying to do is to create a moral logic within the logic of, almost within the logic of neoclassical. I'm trying to create which within the uh, logic, logic of moral what? logic within moral. the logic moral of logic. neoclassical economics because you're so carefully avoiding any discussion of morality or ideology in talking about why the coercion for yeah. these public goods. I mean, no, I, I thought I was trying to just create a logic within the logic of that. Now I'm a you know I hope I mean I'm not I mean I'm, I'm a very moral person, but I'm a little bit of a moral person, and it means a great deal to me whether or not actually I act morally. Um, oh, no, my no, moral I, self I means a great deal to me. So, but I was making this this argument. As much as I could outside that logic, um, I mean, outside the mor mor morality for 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 for, com for completely intentional reasons, you know, um, because I thought 
you know, um, sort of, if you were to teach undergraduates this logic, they could go home to their dorms or their sororities or whatever and um, say to their libertarian friends, so what do you do about free access goods? And they wouldn't have to go into the realm of morality. So I guess in that case, I wonder why you didn't draw on the debate between Derek Cardin and... Why well, I didn't do what? You didn't talk at all about the, um, the tragedy of the commons argument. Well, this is the tragedy of the commons. That's when, when I gave the papers. The tragedy of the commons actually came quite late in that series. Um, when did he write it? Um, I think, you know, I think he may have written it after, even after Olson. So it just happened they got a really good title. But um, that was not, a, 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 not an intellectual contribution. So most of the work, intellectual work happened in the 50s. Um, but Mansur Olson really like, worked it through and nailed it by 65. And then there was, there was sort of other stuff, like Hardin's tragedy comments. Um, so none of this is new. All I'm trying to do is to say that when it came out, people on the left, people in sociology sort of said, oh, well, that's sort of economic thinking, you know. And, and there was a huge amount of work trying to show that solidarity and duty and everything did a lot of good. And yes, it does. 77% of the good, well, 77% did it without any kind of coercion whatsoever. This is a good group of people, and 77% did it. Um, so, you know, we didn't need it. And, and so, the, so there tended to be, um, made us big fuss. Art said, you know, is this pretty much all of sociology? And then it kind of declined. And the left never took it up as, it was sort of anti-left. It was perceived as an, 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 not just non-left, but actually anti-left. And, and similarly, um, you know, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit next time, but you know, I've been in resistance movements all my life. I mean, look, the women's movement was a, it was based on resistance to male oppression. And the, you know, I teach Foucault, and um, you know, I, I, I think resistance is extremely important. Um, and I think the left tradition of resistance is extremely important. Um, and I think the, the mainstream resistance, the Madisonian, Federalist, et cetera, tradition of resistance, which we'll talk about next time, is extremely important. It's just that I think that we've tended to kind of think that that was the only message we have to give, whereas I think we have to also give the message of legitimate coercion. Um, so that's, um, yes? Um, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to give you a couple of thoughts just to prompt you on what you, you were talking about right now, um, because of the, one of the parts of your talk that was, um, was that struck me was that at least um, you know two or three times you kind of offhand said you know I don't even know what soci sociology majors understand this logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so in my casual sort of collecting, um, I, I, I've been uh, collecting these books from my childhood from from you know from, from online. And one of them is this is this book that belongs to a series of social studies texts that were used in grade schools and middle schools in the 50s and 60s. Um, and the editor was this guy, Paul Hanna, who was a, who was a professor of education at Stanford. Um, and it was like pure kind of mid-century, optimistic, sort of um, breaking down in like little narrative vignettes in this textbook um, explanations for like how government works or how our like what we would call like maybe like our civil society or our you know our neighborhoods yeah. or just our just our functioning society. Yeah. Like how do they work? And they have these like real world little like stories of like, oh there was a story of a flood and like well what do we have to do to handle the flood? Yeah. Or why do we have this flood control? There was one about a drought, like, oh, this is why we have to turn off our sprinklers and we can't play in the water. Um, you know, like kind of and it's interesting to me because it's all about the same time as what you're talking about with the academic research and the formalization of this language because obviously in these books they're not using that language but it's kind of like setting the stage for this sort of like you know this sort of like uh, uh, moral sort of you know um, landscape of like well why do we all have to do these things um, but then you know in my mind this problem is like you know from there I could kind of in, in my own sort of growing up memory, it jumps to the negative, which is like Reagan and you know, like people like 
you know, the whole conservative functionaries like Lee Atwater or whatever, putting a face on the free rider um, problem of like a, you know, young female, uh, single mother, you know, you know, parasite kind of thing. Um, and from then on, it seems to me like almost my whole adult life as a leftist is all, all been about like kind of, you know, like just, just trying to undo that and revising American history in light of that. So, you know, it's all about multiculturalism. It's all about identity. It's all about asserting like our presence or our history or, you know, our contribution. And it's not at all going back to what you're talking about, this, this you know, like taking this problem of coercion and, yeah. and functional society. And, and then there's like some sort of, some sort of ideological thing in there because like Paul Hannon himself was like a, he was like a Hoover Institute fellow. Um, so yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, I'd actually love to see, you know, I, that, that's just exactly the kind of meat that I, I like, or things like civics tests and, and social studies texts. Uh, so I would love to see that particular text. Um, what I want to distinguish between is the general, um, and, and, he, and he presumably is doing that because he's talking about why we need government. Because I want to distinguish between the kind of general exhortation to do good stuff for other people, which goes back to, you know, all the religions of the world, and you know, when you get, you know, in Christianity, do unto others as you would be done to, and um, so you know, Kant, uh, don't do anything, you know, make make stuff into a, a universal maxim. I mean, the idea that you should be a nice person um, probably goes back to Adam and Eve. You know, in other words, we are social beings. And they had, oh, in fact, pre-verbal uh, children, um, if they see a, a, a video of a circle that's trying to get up a hill, um, and along comes a triangle and sort of pushes from the bottom and helps the circle up the hill, and then they see another video of the circle's trying to get up the hill, and along comes a square and sort of pushes the circle back, you know. Um, the ch children then, if you offer them to a toy shaped like a, you know, if you offer them toys to play with, and one's a, a triangle that looks like the triangle in the video, and one's a square, like the square in the video, they'll pick the, they'll pick the triangle, the helping one. So this is, I think this is uh, six weeks old or something, I mean this is, this is, I, I can't remember exactly, it's six months maybe it was. Six months, well, it has to be six months. It has to be six months. It has to be six months. It's been too long since I've had a baby. Um, but anyway, this is very, very, very early. People distinguish between helping others, other people who help, and other people who harm. And they like the people who help. They, and that's before they've even gone out in their first playgroup, you know, that they, so, We've been taught as human beings to help. So the, the importance of the free access logic and the role of coercion in it is not just to say you should do good stuff for other people, the solidarity and the duty, but that when these goods are free have the, this particular characteristic of once they've been produced, they can be used without being pay, pay, paying for them. That, that one characteristic, that characteristic, is going to create the free rider problem. It's that characteristic. It's the thing that can be used without paying for it that creates it. There's lots and lots of other good stuff, but this problem is caused by the specific characteristic of bringing something into being, which once it's brought into being, anybody can use it without paying for it. That's the, that's the characteristic of a free access good. That's the characteristic that leads to the coercion. And, and that concept just wasn't gotten by humankind until, you know, the late 50s and, and 65 in particular. So, so that's, my guess is that that is absolutely not there. Although, I'd love to see, but yes, there was all this ferment at that time. There was lots of stuff. People were really thinking about it. I'd love, I'd love to see it. Eric. Yeah, um, a lot of, a lot of the real debate is on what should be included in the list of free access goods, not whether you need 
taxes to cover some. So very few right wingers are opposed to taxes for the military. They recognize you can't have voluntary contributions, but they don't want a big expansive list. Now the big expansive list that the left wants, which would include free concerts and public libraries and good parks and free maybe free public transportation plus and healthcare. So that so we expensive. can make things. Right. We can consciously so, make things as so well. So they're the issues goods. wherever there are private substitutes, even if they're less efficient. It's not enough to argue that it's more efficient to have it be a public, a no. public, a, you know, yeah. a free access good, because the, the argument that the libertarians say is, yeah, maybe more efficient, but it's wrong. It's wrong to provide public libraries because I don't use it and you're, force, you're coercing me to pay for other people's free access. Even if it's a more efficient way to get people, why, why is efficiency a value? I don't care about efficiency, I care about... So the, the case for, pre, for coercion around free access does hit these ideological issues, which may be part of the legitimation Yes, but I'm not going to talk about it specifically. But yes, I agree with you completely that nothing that I've said gives any kind of knockout blow to what um, we ought to create. I mean, maybe we shouldn't create any roads. Maybe we shouldn't have a military. We should, maybe we certainly shouldn't have a military in Vietnam, you know, so to speak. Um, but so, so nothing that I said uh, substitutes for concrete arguments on those specific topics. It just provides a framework uh, that I think we've neglected.